Welcome back to Minitorch. In this module, we'll cover gradients, which is the last topic in our section on tensors. Recall that last class we talked about broadcasting. Broadcasting allows us to combine two tensors of different shape into a third tensor. These rules determine what the shape of that third tensor will be and whether this combination is possible. Broadcasting works with a zip. When zipping together two tensors of the same shape, it's clear how it works. When zipping together two tensors of different shape, my recommendation is to think about each index in the output tensor and think about where it came from. If that dimension was the same as the original shape, then it just came from that location. Otherwise, it gets mapped to index zero. Another way you can think about broadcasting is that implicitly, it's creating a larger tensor. It does this by repeating the tensor values along the axis being broadcast. Now, it's important to remember, this doesn't actually happen. We're not allocating any memory for the larger tensor. But if that helps mathematically, you can think about expanding and then running our standard zip. This also applies when working with larger tensors. In this example here, we have two three-dimensional tensors. We're applying broadcasting. And you can think about them as both expanding along the additional axis. Again, this doesn't actually get created in memory but that expansion will uh, give you, at least theoretically, what the underlying shape would be, and then you can think about just applying standard zip. So in today's class, we're going to move on to covering gradients, which will generalize the idea of differentiation and then auto-differentiation. So our goal is to extend the idea of a derivative to tensors. We're going to be working with tensor functions, and these functions, which will take a tensor as input and output a tensor as output, will have many different derivatives. From a high level, we'll think about functions that take tensor inputs as being like scalar functions with multiple arguments. We'll think about functions that produce a tensor output as being like multiple different functions. When we define backward, we'll have to define a chain rule that allows us to map from output gradient values to input gradient values. In terms of terminology, so first approximation, we're going to map from scalars to tensors. In the same sense, we're going to map from derivatives to gradients. So just as a tensor consists of many different scalar operations, we'll think of a gradient as storing many different derivatives. My recommendation for this section is to try to map things down to what you know about scalar derivatives, and then try to reason about how these would act on tensors. So let's start with an example of how this looks like. Here we'll have two different tensors, x and y. We'll then multiply them together. This multiplication is like a zip. We'll then take a sum, which will be a reduction, down to a scalar value. We'll then call backward on that scalar value. In doing this, we'll create many different derivatives, which will be packaged up into a gradient. We'll have a gradient associated with both x and y that represents the change in our final value based on small changes to any of the cells in the original x and y tensors. In terms of notation, things will work roughly in the same way as we've seen before. We're going to define a function capital G, which is a function from tensors to tensors. It'll take a tensor as its input and return a tensor as its output. Just as with our scalar class, it will unwrap that value, do some operation, and then return a wrapped value. The wrapped value will remember which function was called to create it. We're going to now focus in on what G looks like as a mathematical object. Let's start with an example. Here, we're going to assume that G is a function of three arguments, x1, x2, and x3. But instead of representing them as three different arguments, we'll represent them as a tensor of shape 3. Its output will be a tensor of shape 1, that is, a scalar value. That scalar value will be the product of these three inputs. Now, let's reason about this as if it were just a standard scalar function. By now, you should be able to calculate the three derivatives associated with this function. These three derivatives just get calculated by applying the standard rules, and we end up with x2, x3, x1, x3, and x1, x2. We can package these derivatives up back into a tensor themselves. So here I'll represent the three derivatives we've calculated as a tensor of length 3. Here I'm representing them as z divided by x1, z divided by x2, and z divided by x3 to show that I can do some shared computation in these calculations. Here the original g was a function from a tensor to a scalar, 
and our gradient g prime is a function from a tensor to a tensor. Note that g prime takes in three arguments, x1, x2, x3, and returns a tensor of shape 3. The next step is to think about what the chain rule looks like for this function. Recall that the chain rule was to assume there would be another function f that would take the uh, output of g as its input. Here, g returns a scalar, and we'll say f is a scalar-to-scalar -scalar function. Also recall that d was equal to the derivative f prime given the input z. From this, we can then apply the chain rule that we applied for scalar values. The chain rule tells us that the final derivative that gets backpropagated to x1 is x2 times x3 times d. This backprop value is similar for the other inputs x. So what's happened? Well, we've created a chain rule. It takes exactly the same form as what we've seen with scalar values. The only difference was instead of taking three arguments as input, we took a tensor of shape three. This conveys that in this particular case, things work out as you would expect. Next, let's look at the implementation. So to implement these uh, gradient backpropagations, we're going to implement a function just as we did with scalars. This function will take a tensor x as its input and return a tensor as its output. You can see that this looks like as you'd expect, where we utilize all three values of this tensor to create the product. We save both the input and the product for backwards. And then on the backwards pass, we create a tensor of shape three that represents the three values we backpropagate. The key thing to note here is that the input to forward should have the same shape as the output of backward. Similarly, the output of forward will have the same shape as the input to backward. This is just saying that the boxes work in the same way that they worked before. Okay, so that's the case where the function maps from a tensor to a scalar. Things get a little bit more complex when we map from a tensor to a tensor. So let's talk through some of those examples. So in the general case, we'll assume that we have a g that returns a tensor value. So far, we've only dealt with functions that return a single value. So this is the first time we'll deal with functions that return multiple values. Let's define our notation here using a superscript notation. So specifically, we're going to pretend we don't know anything about tensors and assume that g is really n different functions. Each of these functions just return a scalar value like we're used to, but we give them all a different name. This will be a little more clear when we look at an example. So here's an example where we take a single argument x. We have a single tensor function g that returns two different values but we'll call these g superscript 1 and g superscript 2. We can think about this in the picture below. The mathematical formula looks a bit complicated, but it's just going to tell us to handle this just like we would with a graph from module 1. Specifically, the notation will say that there are two values, d1 and d2. Both of these correspond to the values that get backpropagated from the first output of g and the second output of g. The chain rule says that we should sum these values together. And the way we sum them together is by summing d times the derivative of input xj with respect to output i. Again, the mathematical equation is a bit complicated. So I think when we go through an example, you'll see a bit more what's going on. But basically what it's telling us is to sum over the product of each of the inputs to our backward function by each of the derivatives of our tensor function. So the main change here is that instead of having a single d value in backprop, we're now going to have a d value for each of our output arguments. It's our responsibility to make sure each of these d values get multiplied by the right derivative of our tensor function g. OK, so I think this will be more clear when we run through an example. In this example here, the input shape is 2 and the output shape is 2. We get in x1 to x2, and we're going to return x1 in the first position and x1 times x2 in the second position. Using our tricks from before, we're going to think about this as being like two different functions. g superscript 1 is equal to x1, and g superscript 2 is equal to x1 times x2. Given that setup, we can compute the derivative of each output with respect to each input. This corresponds to computing four different derivatives. So the first is the derivative of x1 with respect to x1. 
that's one. The second is the derivative of x1 with respect to x2, that's zero. Then we have the derivative of x2 with respect to x1, that's x2. And then the, the derivative of x1 and times x2 with respect to x2, that's x1. Given these individual derivatives, we can plug in our chain rule. In our chain rule, we're going to have a sum over the output positions and multiply each of the d-values we received by the corresponding derivative. So here we have d1 times 1 plus d2 times x2. You can go back to the previous slide and see why 1 and x2 are there. And for x2, we have d2 times x1. This is only one term because the other value was multiplied by 0. This corresponds to the two values that we need to compute for backward, and then we need to return them in a tensor. That tensor should have shape 2. So let's look at the implementation of the forward and backward for this function. Here's the code. My fun is a mini torch function. Its forward value takes in a tensor and returns a tensor. That tensor is of shape 2, corresponding to x sub 1 and x sub 2 in the math. Its backwards function takes in a tensor corresponding to d. This has two values in it that corresponds to what was passed back as part of the chain rule. It returns a tensor itself that has two values corresponding to the derivatives with respect to x1 and x2. So these were the derivatives of arbitrary tensor functions. However, most of the time when reasoning about deep learning algorithms, we don't need to think about really complex functions. We can just consider the specific cases of the functions we often use. To avoid really having to think hard about gradients, let's reason about things in terms of the scalar values that get created. Specifically, we're going to reason about the scalar values in the core functions that we often use in our mathematical calculations. So in particular, let's think about the map function. How would we think about map as a function from tensors to tensors? If we take in a tensor x1 through xn, map is really going to apply a scalar function to each of these values individually. So if we think about the ith output value, does changing the jth input value really have any impact? In fact, for a map, the only value that will have impact on an output value is the one at the same position. So to make this formal, we can look at the derivatives and the chain rule for map. So what we find is that the derivative for any time the output and input position are not the same will always be zero. That means when running the chain rule, all we need to do is take into account the d value that corresponds to the output position and multiply that by the derivative of the map function, which will give us back the value we need to apply the chain rule. So this complicated formulation really just looks like the following picture. When running map, we'll be given a d value for every one of our output values. We simply multiply that value by the derivative that we need to calculate just by computing the derivative of the function in the map. This looks like applying exactly what we did for scalar backwards, but now we just do it for every position in our tensor. To make this more concrete, let's look at the implementation of negation. So here we have negation. This is the implementation we did when it was a scalar. Our forward was just minus a, and our backwards was just minus d. That's because the derivative of negation is just negative 1. Now let's look at the same calculation for negating a tensor. If our input is a tensor t1, we can simply return applying a neg map, that is mapping negation, to every one of the tensor values. On the backward pass, we're given a tensor, which is exactly the same shape as our output, and we simply need to multiply d by each value uh, of our derivative. So to do this, we just run a neg map backwards, where we negate all the values of d. That is, we multiply minus 1 times all the values we were given. Here's a slightly more interesting case. If we have the inversion function, where we simply take 1 over x for every value x in our original tensor, we create a map function that inverts each of our values on forward. On backwards, we need to take the derivative of inversion and multiply each one of these derivatives by d. So this looks like a zip where we do the multiplication of the derivative we needed by each of the values in d. Zip is going to look very similar 
if you think about the way zip works, really the only input positions that affect the output positions are the ones that end up in the same location. So that is if we have two vectors, x and y, position x sub i and y sub i are the only values that are going to affect the output value at position i. So we get something that looks very similar to map, where we get zero derivatives for all the cross terms and only non-zero derivatives for the terms at the same position. If we draw the picture here, we can see that if we're given a d value for every position in our output, we need to basically multiply these by each of the derivatives that we got when computing that value. So you can think about the backwards pass here as just being a zip that goes back to each of the original positions. Let's look at the implementation. So here's our class, it's called add. To compute the output value, we'll do something like calling add zip between t1 and t2. That is add together all of the positions in t1 and t2. This will produce a new tensor. On the backward pass, we're given a d or grad output that corresponds to every position in our output tensor. We need to then produce two return values, one for x and one for y. In this case here, the derivative is just going to be one for each of these, so we can just return our grad output. This is equivalent to applying a zip where we multiply grad output by one. If we had a function like negate, we'd have to negate all the values in grad output to send it back. If we have a function like multiply, we end up multiplying the first grad output by y and the second by x. You can play through some of these examples on the homework to get a sense of how it works. Finally, we have to consider the case of reduce. Again, just playing through the scalar calculations, each position in our final reduce is only influenced by the positions that were reduced in order to create its value. So therefore, its derivative will be unaffected by all the other positions. To reason through this, we just have to think about how each of these values influence the final position. We'll ask you to implement some of the reductions on the homework, so I'll leave the implementation for you to figure out. So that about ends our coverage of gradients. I've noticed that this is an area where students struggle when first learning PyTorch. To help you out, I've created another set of puzzles known as Autodiff puzzles, and I'll include a link in the YouTube description. I think this is something that with some practice and some careful bookkeeping, you can work out. I, I don't think there's anything inherently mathematically hard. It's just about kind of computing the scalar derivatives and tracing through where things end up. If you can think about it like that and work through some common examples, I think you'll gain a lot of mastery and a lot of very challenging problems in deep learning will become much easier to work through. Okay, good luck.